words are used that way in the Bible as well. Leaven. <clears throat> Leaven, more often than not, is used in a negative sense. It's talking about, um, it, it usually is kind of a metaphor, I think is the word I'm looking for, for sin, uh, for things that are bad, the way sin can tend to spread. Leaven, of course, spreads. You put a little leaven, a little leaven, leaven it the whole lump, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. Um, but sometimes, at least in one instance, Jesus compared the kingdom of heaven to leaven that was you know, hidden in a lump and, and it began to spread. And he said that's basically the way that the kingdom or the church is going to be. It's going to spread. Well, that's obviously using it in a good sense. So you have to look contextually. Jealousy typically is a bad thing, and, but not always. For instance, um, let's just look at this, this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Somebody get that for us, please. <clears throat> and while you're turning there, let me just say this, and this is one of those that, you know, I, I even debated discussing it because I, I think it's pretty obvious, but, but we want to make sure we understand. Um, there is sometimes when jealousy is, not only is it not a bad thing, it's a very good thing. For instance, it, again, as long as it's kept within a right context, um, is it good for a husband to be jealous over his wife? Well, not to the point that he won't let her go out of the house or he starts demanding to know everybody to whom she's speaking and so on and so forth. But is it good for him to be jealous in the sense that he doesn't want her to be with any other men? No, that's a, that's a good thing. I, you know, I, I would want my wife to be jealous over me in that sense. So there, you know, is a sense in which it's good. Who's got that passage? 2 Corinthians 11, Brother Ricky. Uh, 2 to 4. <laughs> Okay, so Paul says he's jealous over them with a godly jealousy. In other words, the idea that there's a sense in which one can be jealous for something that rightfully belongs to them. Paul says, you rightfully belong to the Lord, and I'm jealous over you in that sense because I want to keep you. Of course, he, you know, he uses the, the term, uh, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 4, 15, I've begotten you through the gospel. So he feels like, kind of like a father figure to them spiritually. And so he says, I want to make sure you stay faithful as the bride of Christ to the bridegroom. So, you know, there's a sense in which it is okay to be jealous within bounds over something that rightfully belongs to you. We see this, by the way, in Numbers 25 as well. But for time's sake, we won't go look at that. So <clears throat> that just kind of concludes what we were talking about. And again, these are not uh, all the ones that we could look at, not even all the ones that Eric has in his book. But I, I have to call some of these out. And so I try to pick the ones that I think will be most, um, maybe that we've heard of before, or maybe the most, um, in some cases, the more difficult ones to answer. Some of them I think the answer is pretty obvious. But uh, some of these I want to deal with because either they're common or because I feel like it's something that may be a, a question maybe I've had before, maybe that you might be dealing with. But let's talk about copyist errors. Uh, there's no doubt that there are some copyist errors in the Bible. And some people, uh, when you're talking about alleged Bible discrepancies, and, and let me give my disclaimer here, by the way. Some of this, if you were in the How We Got the Bible class, is going to sound familiar, and that, that's okay because that's just kind of the nature of uh, learning anything is that sometimes there's overlap. But um, sometimes when you're talking about alleged Bible discrepancies and you come across something, and uh, we'll look at at least one, but... You know, uh, I'll try to keep an eye on the time here so we can make sure we look at at least one of these because I want to give you an example where you look at it. <clears throat> we, we've talked about different general principles for looking at an alleged Bible discrepancy. It may be a different sense under consideration, a different sense of the word. It may be a different person. It may be a different place. It may be a different thing. You know, we talked about, for instance, with Jericho. Jesus, was Jesus coming into Jericho when he healed these two blind men or was he going out? Well, it may be both, because there were two different Jerichos in ancient, uh, in, in ancient Palestine, or at least Palestine in Jesus' time. Uh, 
So there, there are all those options. But then sometimes you look at all those things and you say, okay, there's no reconciling these two passages. They are absolutely in conflict with one another. And so before we decide, you know what, I, I've, I'm giving up on the Bible. It clearly is not inspired. It's not infallible. Before we decide that, there's another thing that we need to consider. It may be that what you have is, a, is a, an example of a copyist error. And what will sometimes happen is a, a skeptic or, or someone who is asking these questions or, or maybe has these alleged discrepancies in mind or throws them out or whatever you want to say, they may say, oh, okay, so there's your safety net, copyist error. You know, you're just going to chalk it up to a copyist error. But let's, let's use some reasoning here. Does anybody, by the way, here have a Bible? Maybe you've had a Bible for a long time and know. Some, some of you may have not had a Bible long enough to uh, catch a spot. But I've, I've got, it's not this Bible, but I have a Bible in, in my office. It was one I used in preaching school. And there, I found at least two spots in it. This is done in an age of computerized, stamp it out. Everything's going to be exactly the same. And I found at least two errors just in that little Bible. Just printer errors. In fact, one page, you know how at the top of your page it'll give you the, the book and the chapter where you're reading. And so, you know, I've got one page where I open where it says Acts 7. And you go to the next page where you're in Acts 8 by the next page. But the top of that page says Acts 7. Well, you know, that's obviously a printer error. That would be kind of akin to a copyist error. Uh, Eric, in, in an article that I read, Eric Lyons from Apologetics Press, talks about um, a Bible that he saw where it's Matthew 22, verse 12, where Jesus has the, the king asking, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? <clears throat> well, then there's another Bible that mentions, and this is not another translation. This is the same translation, just another edition, another printed version of it. And it says, friend, now... Did you come in here without a wedding garment? Well, we understand the letter N and the letter H in English are very similar. You get a smudge on that stem of the H, and suddenly it looks like an N. And sometimes in printing it may get smudged and come across looking like... Uh, he gives another example where there's the word and, A-N-D. And there was another edition of same same translation of the Bible that got printed with an A-N-O. Well, that's obviously a typo. We, we often, in our day and age of computers and typing and printing, we call it a typo. Well, in their day and age, they would call it, or what we would call it now is a, a copyist error. But think about some common sense with these copyist errors. <clears throat> There's no doubt that there are some of these within the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. But before the printing press, copies had to be made by hand. And again, even in the day and age of computers and printing presses, it's not flawless because there's, there's always some room for error. That's just the human side of anything. Tacitus, Roman historian, his writings are known to contain at least one numerical error that scholars have agreed is a copious mistake. Um, Herodotus, Josephus, Pliny, Tacitus, Suetonius, so on and so forth. These writers are cited by scholars. They're considered trustworthy. They're considered educational in spite of copyist errors that you can find in many of those copies. Sometimes people say, well, how did these errors occur? And we'll, we'll talk more about this, this common sense with uh, copyist errors in, in just a moment because there's, there's more that we want to say about that. But it's easy to recognize when you're copying something by hand, you don't have wonderful lighting many times. You don't have a nice cozy chair, you're not sitting at a desk with lumbar support and so on and so forth, it's easy to understand how it becomes a lot more difficult to task to produce an, an absolute, absolutely flawless copy. Well, how did these errors occur? <clears throat> this is what we talked about a little bit before in our How We Got the Bible class. It may be that a scribe omits or repeats a letter, word, or line. For instance, you get to the end of a line, and we've talked about this before. Who among us has not done that? Where you're copying something from a book, and you read a line, and you go to the next line, and you maybe get the first half of that line, 
and you're, you're looking, especially if you're not a, um, I can type a little bit, but I can't, I'm not one of these where I can never look at the keyboard. Uh, I've, I've got to, uh, even if I'm not looking at the keyboard, I got to look at the screen. I don't know. I just want to make sure what I'm typing is right, I guess. But uh, I've done this before where I look back at my paper or whatever, and I get the first part of that line, and I look up to make sure I, I got it typed right, and then I look back, and instead of grabbing the rest of that line, I grab the second half of the line above it. And so sometimes you come back and you read something and you go, what? What is that? And, and sometimes it actually makes sense, but it's clearly not what you were intending to say. And, and you look at it and you say, I, I, you know, that's a, that's a logical sentence, or at least it forms a complete sentence. But, you know, there are times when it just forms gibberish. But, uh, you know, there are times when you see it and you say, okay, that, but that, I know that's not what that was saying. So you get the idea. It may be that sometimes we skip a line. I get to the end of a line, that's more common for me. I get to the end of the line and I drop down to the next, only I've dropped down two lines instead of one. And then continue on. And so sometimes you come back and you read it and there's a gap and you say, okay, that, I'm positive that's not what that sentence is supposed to say. So that happened with them as well. Reversals or transposition of letters and words, now and not in English. I do that all the time. And what a difference that can make, right? We are... You know, somebody may type in and say, uh, hey, Chad, what's, a, what's the status on such and such? And I may type back and say, we're not ready to go on that. Well, what I meant to say was we are now ready to go on that. You know, and especially in a work situation, the boss gets that. He writes back and fires back an email and says, hey, you know, your deadline was today. Why is this not ready? And, you know, well, I just transposed a letter. I meant to say we are now ready. And that happens sometimes. Some of them uh, actually are humorous. But uh, we, we do this from time to time where we transpose letters and words. Divisions of words in the wrong places. I believe we talked about this little uh, sentence here when we were studying how we got the Bible. What does that say? <clears throat> well, depending on how you divide it, it could say God is now here or it might say God is nowhere, depending on where a person decides to divide that. But that's an English equivalent of how your New Testament manuscripts nine times out of ten, or at least until later on, were, were copied. In the Greek, all caps, no punctuation, no spaces. <clears throat> I don't know why they did that. In fact, I was thinking about that this weekend as I was going over my notes, and I thought, you know, I guess, uh, you know, there, there's just different ways of doing things at different times, and that's how, they, that's how they did it. But it sure makes it difficult for people who are translating. Uh, and I suppose, you know, that's why you have to study the language, and some of these people that are such, such experts in the Greek language are able to look at sentences such as that, and they can distinguish in an instance because they, can, uh, they know different uses, usages of the verb and things like that, and they can, uh, they can figure it out from the context as well. Context so many times answers these questions more often than not. Then there are errors of hearing. Maybe somebody's dictating. Might be two or three copies being made at one time. And so you've got these scribes and they're, uh, they're sitting there or standing there as the case may be and, and they're writing as someone reads. Well, th this can happen now. I'm trying to think of a word off the top of my head. What's a word that sounds... Um, boy, if I wasn't trying to think of one, I could probably think of four, three or four. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of a word that sounds the same but it's spelled differently. Is it homonym? Is that what you call them in English? And where's an English major when you need one? Do what? Yeah, that's a good one. Where? Um, where did you put that? W-H-E-R-E. -E. As opposed to wear, as in wearing clothing and wearing something out. W-E-A-R. But they sound very similar. So you could see where if you're... <clears throat> in fact, sometimes, you know, and I've been in classes where an instructor's dictating or something and, you know, you think you hear something and you say, that doesn't quite sound right. And I may say... Uh, Hey, Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so, did, did you say? And they may say, no, 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 no. That's not what I said. And you know what? Sometimes the one who's dictating may say it wrong or read it wrong or skip to the next line. I mean, skip two lines down instead of to the next line. <clears throat> so there's all kinds of things that can happen in those situations that would result in a copyist error. Sometimes copyists would trust in their memory. This happens... Um, I was just reading of, of a preacher who memorized 2 Peter 3.9. Now, 
this is um, 2 Peter 3. <laughs> Just, I'm struggling today. My memory's going out. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he says he quoted it for years, literally for years. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Promises, plural. And he said, you know, he just happened to be reading the verse one day and read it. And he said, well, that's not right. And he even said, you know, I got a typo in this Bible. And I've done that before where I'm doing my daily reading in my, my old Bible that I used in preacher school. And I see something and I go, that's not right. I, 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 I know that verse. And so I get out this, this Bible, which is a different edition of the same King James Version. You know, and I look it up and I'll say, yeah, okay, another typo in this Bible, you know. And then I look it up and go, huh, I guess that is right. You know, and then you realize I've been quoting that thing wrong for who knows how long. Well, sometimes that happens. Well, scribes, copyists, many times they're going long. Oh, I know that verse. And so they finish it out. And it turns out they didn't know it. I had a word wrong or transposed or something. Especially in similar verses. You know, in the gospel accounts, there are some verses that are very similar. Then there are errors in judgment. <clears throat> Many times these are due to poor eyesight. Sometimes it's insufficient lighting. Of course, you know, the not ideal conditions for uh, doing this, especially doing it all day in many cases back then. And then sometimes there's poor penmanship. I read, uh, in fact, I think it's in Eric's article where he talked about asking someone to send a letter to Mr. or I think it was actually Mrs. Word. Well, the letter got sent to Mrs. Word, but it was supposed to go to Mrs. Ward. Well, A and O in the English language are easy to, if you don't make that distinction clear enough, somebody will get mixed up and can easily confuse those. Uh, yes, sir, Brother Scott. Yeah, that does make a lot more sense. Um, and that would be, a, you know, if that be the case, that's a classic example of a copyist error. Camelos, you know, obviously two words that sound basically exactly the same. Um, might be a different accent or something, but somebody gets in a hurry reading that, and it's very easy for that to be misunderstood, and suddenly you end up with a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle. That's a, but that's an interesting uh, and, uh, and really a perfect example of what we're talking about here with mishearing something or, or you know, might have, been, might have been trusting in judgment, might even be poor penmanship. Somebody may have just written that sloppily and it got mistaken, but uh, a good example of exactly what we're talking about here. So that's a, that's a few ways, <clears throat> possible ways that copyist errors occur. Who are the copyists? Who would, just kind of go through this fairly quickly because I think most of us, I think most of us were in our how we got the Bible study. The Masoretes are the most famous of the scribe of the copyists, scribes, similar. I guess we're talking basically synonymous terms there. Somewhere around A.D. 500 to 950, these these men were not flawless by any stretch, but uh, they were extremely conscientious. We've talked before about how before they would write the name of God, they would. Um, clean themselves, they would uh, take a new pen and it just very, very reverent with the scriptures. But, you know, at the end of the day, they were human. So they, they would sometimes make errors, although very, very few. They understood they were copying the word of God. They would count letters, words, and verses of each book. How many letters are in the book? How many words are in the book? How many verses? 
They also would count the middle letter, the middle word, the middle verse of each book, and also sections of the Old Testament, such as the Pentateuch, Psalms, <clears throat> and even the entire Old Testament text. What that does is you get some guy brings you a copy and says, uh, here you go, Nehemiah is done. And maybe you know that Nehemiah has, I don't know how many words Nehemiah has, maybe it has two or 3,000 words. <clears throat> so the word count's added up, and you say, this copy has, you know, 3,998 words. You've omitted two words somewhere, and they'd trash it. That's how meticulous they were. And they could even furthermore go, okay, you know, here's the Pentateuch. I finished making my copy of the Pentateuch. They could, they could then go and say, okay, the middle word of the Pentateuch is in Numbers chapter 1 or wherever. I don't know where the middle word of the Pentateuch is. But they could go right to it and say, okay, it should be and, and know the Hebrew word. And they go to it and that's not the middle word. Trashed. And they start over. <clears throat> so that's how careful they were. Now, again, it's not, it's not 100% because there's still a human element, but that's how rare errors become when you take those kind of uh, precautions. So it's very easy to determine if a word's been added or omitted. Now, there's not as much known about New Testament copyists as about the Old Testament ones. Uh, I mentioned the Masoretes. They were the most famous. There were also, um, I'm forgetting the name of these other fellows, but there were, there were other ones that he mentions. Sopharim. I'm pronouncing that right. That's around the time of Ezra until about A.D. 200, and then the Talmudic period, which will be A.D. 100 to somewhere around A.D. 500. But uh, those are the three periods of Old Testament scribes. Not as much known about the New Testament copyists, but uh, it is clear that these fellows worked with a, a great deal of precision. More often than not, they were educated, they were professionals. <clears throat> and their motivation came from such scriptures as Revelation 22, 18, and 19. Somebody look that up for us. In fact, it's interesting, Irenaeus, somewhere in the second century, actually applied this scripture to copyists who would willingly, knowingly contribute to textual errors. <clears throat> Who's got that? Go ahead, Brother Gary. All right, so the seriousness of adding to or taking away from God's Word. In fact, we often talk about this today and trying to make sure that we do everything in accordance with God's will because we understand the seriousness of, of adding to God's Word or taking away from it. That's why we don't want to follow any kind of a human creed because that would be adding to God's Word. We don't want to say, you know, well, I'm just going to ignore this certain section of Scripture because I don't like that as much or it doesn't agree with my preconceived notions. That would be taking away from the Bible. And, of course, if we had a creed book or manifesto or whatever it might be that says the same thing as the Bible, well, that's just superfluous. The Bible is sufficient. So over and over again in the Scriptures, we're warned about adding to or taking away from it. And that would apply in textual error as well, adding to the text or taking away intentionally. But, again, there's, there's a human element, so sometimes it happens. But thanks to these conscientious copyists... The New Testament's not only survived in far more manuscript copies than any other antique book, but it's also survived in a far purer form than any other. Sometimes the question is asked, well, you know, if, if, if we know that what we have today are copies of copies, and if we know that there are some copyist errors within those copies, well, then how can we know that we have the truth? And, and again, this is a little bit of review, but I don't think this point can be overemphasized because sometimes people make this point. I've had this point made to me. It's been several years ago when I was, before I ever even went to preaching school, I was just a boy, but somebody made a similar statement to me and I just kind of didn't know what to say. In fact, you know, I kind of thought, hmm, well, that's something to think about. And it is worth thinking about, but we need to find the answer. How do we know we have the truth? We don't have any originals. We don't have Paul's original letter to the Corinthians or the Thessalonians or, or Matthew's original gospel account or Mark's or Luke's or John's or any of the books. Any book of the Bible. No originals. In fact, as far as we know, I don't believe there's one that they suspect there's a slight possibility, but even that's probably a long shot, that it's a copy of the original. Most are copies 
I think it's fair to say all, are copies of copies. <clears throat> so sometimes people say, well, I mean, how are we going to know? How can anybody trust the Bible and say that it is truth? Here's the thing, though. Using reliable copies of various documents to learn things, to form beliefs, that's a way of life, folks. We do it every single day. Who in here is a teacher? We got teachers there. I was looking for Cindy and Mark and Joel. You're teaching, right? You use textbooks, right? Do you have the original that came off the printing press? I mean, the one that the guy typed out and sent to the printer? That's the autograph of that textbook. I mean, what would you say, Miss Cindy, if one of your third grade students stood up one day and said, I don't think I can trust this textbook because this is a copy. And, and quite frankly, I think it's probably a copy of a copy, maybe even of a copy of a copy. And I don't know that I can trust this, Miss Spake. So I'm just going to have to politely decline to take this test. I don't think that's going to go over, is it, Miss Cindy? <laughs> I may have given somebody an idea if the kids were in here, but um, be worth a shot, but it's not going to happen. But, you know, we understand that. You go to take a driver's test, and you say, you know, when the guy says, I'm, I'm sorry, you didn't pass your driver's test, you say, listen, can anybody really trust this driver's manual? I mean, is this the original? I don't, I don't think this is the original, is it? Well, no, sir, it's not. Okay, then. I bet it's even a copy of a copy, isn't it? Well, yes, sir, it is. We, we've, we've had this edition for a few years now. Uh-huh. So you can't fail me on my driver's test because I, nobody can even trust this book. We wouldn't be so foolish as to say something like that. This is everyday life, folks. Nobody goes and says when something is being measured... Maybe you go somewhere and they're going to measure you out some fabric. Some of you folks that like to sew. I was going to say ladies, but I'll be fair. Um, so, some of you folks that like to sew, you go to get you some fabric. Uh, and they measure it out and you say, now, now hold on. What, what you using there? Well, I'm using a yardstick. Where'd you get that? Well, we got it right here in the store. Well, where'd they get it? Well, from the distributor and so on. Is that the original yard? Well, no, you know, it's not the original yard, but it was copied from the original, right? Well, no, they've got a, they got a machine there in the factory. And they just... So what you're telling me is this yardstick that you're using to measure out my fabric that I'm going to pay for with my hard-earned money is made from a copy of a copy of a copy yardstick? And you think I'm going to trust that? Well, you know, to my knowledge, nobody's ever done that. Nobody's ever gone in the gas station and pitched a fit about the gallon and saying, look, I, you know, I want to know, do you have the original gallon here at your station so I can measure every single one of my gallons and make sure I'm getting my exact money's worth? It's a way of life, folks. We do it all day, every day in so many areas of life, and we don't have a problem with that. We understand it's reliable. Truths can be gained from copy, gleaned from copies, not just autographs. We talked about the measurements and the manuals. Here's the thing, <clears throat> what's going to be more conducive to altering the truth if you're someone who's seeking to stamp out Christianity, whether the devil or someone in his service, what's, what's more conducive to doing that? To change one single copy to get your hands on it? Man, we might say we're going to put this thing under lock and key, it's going to make Fort Knox look like nothing. We're going to have it so secured that you know what? There's nothing that can't be destroyed. I mean, it may be a natural disaster. It may be, uh, it may be a man-made disaster. It may be the, the world's most brilliant criminal mind who decides to come up with a way to steal it. But nothing is completely safe, no matter how safe we think it is. So is that easier to get your hands... It may, it may be under lock and key, but to get your hands on that one and destroy it and go, now where's your Bible? Or to try to get thousands upon thousands upon thousands of copies and destroy them. You know, the devil may have wiped out every copy of the New Testament in Egypt, but then over in Asia Minor, guess what? They've got them. They've got more. So, uh, Brother Scott, you were going to say something? Uh, the, uh... <clears throat> 
Right. And, and really, that gets into a study of inspiration to understand that inspiration is not a 24-7 process. Um, there were times when Paul could sit down and write a letter, and just because he's writing, he's not writing being born along by the Spirit every single time he puts his pen to paper. Uh, so there were obviously letters that were not inspired. I don't know why. I can't tell you why. Maybe it's because the, truth, the truths contained in that 1 Corinthians letter were maybe some of them were repeated into the, in the first letter. Or maybe they're contained elsewhere in the New Testament. But we know that it's not inspired or we'd, we'd have it. So uh, interesting, interesting thoughts there as far as, you know, but the idea here that it's easier to change a single copy than it would be to change thousands upon thousands upon thousands of copies. That, I think that's easy to see. So no autographs, no originals of the New Testament or any other book of the Bible. That's, that's not a problem. And we need to understand that that, that, that doesn't damage our confidence in the Bible, or at least it shouldn't. <clears throat> so do we have a reliable text? Yes. The Old Testament text is virtually solidified as accurate by the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are other sources that let us know the Old Testament as we have it is, uh, is correct, the canon and the text of it. Uh, but what about the New Testament text? The witnesses to the accuracy of the New Testament text, hopefully you remember this from how we got the Bible, but it's a good review either way. The number of manuscripts... I found a figure, an exact figure, back in 2005. Obviously, some water has gone under the bridge or over the dam or whatever that expression is um, since then. But it's been a few years. But 5,748. If anything, that number's gone up since 2005. Now, occasionally, the number will go down a little bit because they'll discover what they previously thought were two different manuscripts were actually part of the same. And they were just separated. So sometimes they discover that. So that number can go down by one or two occasionally, but most, 99.9% of the time, the number's gradually climbing. But we'll go conservative and say 5,748. That is just flat out amazing. It's just amazing. Uh, that is greater than any other ancient volume that you will find. Next to the New Testament, the most documented book is Homer's Iliad. Do you know how many copies of it there are? 643. That's, that's over 5,000 less than the New Testament. But, do, I mean, have you ever heard anybody say, I like Iliad and it's a good book, but I just really don't know if I trust that text is really what Homer wrote. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a copy of a copy of a copy. I just, I don't know. People don't do that. And look how much more well attested the New Testament is. Number two, the age of the manuscripts. Not only do we have so many of them, but it's the age of them. Most antique books, the closest they get to the original copy or to the original autograph is about a thousand years. With the New Testament, we've got them as early as the second century. And there are some that some scholars speculate, and it's, it's still, you know, there's constant testing going on to try to determine the exact date of these things. Sometimes we may not ever know for sure on some of these. But there are some of these New Testament manuscripts that scholars speculate may very well be from the late first century. That's just a few decades, depending on the book. But at most, a few decades, at, at least just around a decade, from when they were written. Folks, that is amazing. You don't find that with any other book. Another witness to the New Testament text, its accuracy is versions, the old Syriac, the old Latin, the Coptic, and... Uh, Gothic and on and on we could go with these different versions. Some of these versions are older than some of the manuscripts we have. And so you can compare them. Um, Brother Scott, you just mentioned it was the Syriac, right? That you mentioned talking about the Camelot statement. Um, the old Syriac, and then there's the Syriac Peshitta, which means simple. And that's the, that's the one that they thought for years was the Syriac. Then they discovered the old Syriac, which is actually older than the Peshitta. So, you know, all these versions that testify the accuracy of the text... Quotations from early church fathers. Uh, I told you this in our How We Got the Bible class. There's a scholar, several scholars who say if we had every single copy of the New Testament destroyed, if we had no manuscripts, no versions, we could reconstruct the entire text of the New Testament simply from quotations from early church fathers. In some cases also, not just, I guess it would fall in the category of quotations, but lectionaries we call them. Remember we talked about those? Uh, which would be kind of the equivalent of an ancient bulletin. They would have these little sheets and they would write a scripture on them, maybe to be read aloud in worship, maybe just to be 
passed around for people to study and memorize. But these verses, and using those and quotes from early church fathers, we could reconstruct the entire New Testament text. That's amazing in and of itself. But you put all this together, you can reconstruct the text with easel, easily knowing that what you've got is the accurate text. Yes, sir. When the uh, <coughs> King James was written in, what, 1611, there were less than 10 old versions, I mean, original copies. So that number up there, 5748, is not just since 1611. That's really since about 1800. Oh, yeah. And a lot of it's due to advances in archaeology and technology. And, I mean, there's just been an explosion of them. You're right. I mean, when the King James was translated, um, and that's why it's good to, you know, I, I, I tell people I like the King James because I've memorized so much out of it. But it's good to compare and study the King James in comparison with other versions because there's so much more manuscript evidence available since it was translated. And that's a good point as well. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes, so... Here are just a couple of passages that talk about God's word being incorruptible. It endures forever. 1 Peter 1, 22 to 25. Wow, we don't have a couple of minutes. Um, let me give you this real quick. How old was Jehoiakim when he reigned? This is a classic example of a copyist error. 2 Kings says he was 18 years old. 2 Chronicles says he was 8 years old. There's no way to reconcile those. They are in direct disagreement. So do we determine that the Bible is not accurate, that this is an error and the Bible is obviously not inspired? Well, there's a, there's a much easier explanation for that and much more accurate explanation. He began to reign at 18, 18 years of age. It's clear. They, somebody just left off a 10. There's a prophecy that deals with Jehoiakim in Ezekiel 19. It would hardly apply to an 8-year-old boy about going up and down among the people. And in 2 Chronicles, it, it describes him, and really 2 Kings as well, describes him as having done evil in the sight of the Lord. I hardly would think that an eight-year-old boy is going to be described as having done evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, he was an evil king. He was sinful. He was punished by God. That describes an 18-year-old. Clearly what happened is a copy is somehow left off a 10. And I'm by no means an expert in Hebrew, but I've looked at enough Hebrew to know, buddy, it's not easy. It is, it is, very, it is very difficult and I, I look at some of the characters and the letters, and letters were used for numbers, by the way, and some of them are so similar that I wonder how anybody could distinguish one from the other. You obviously would have to study it and be basically an expert, so it's very easy under poor conditions, writing by hand, so on and so forth, to make such a copyist error. But these need not hurt our confidence in the accuracy of the biblical text. All right, thank you very much. I got through it, and so next week we'll start another kind of theme and look at some alleged discrepancies. Thank you all very much.